Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Rob Hirschfeld. And this is Mark Teeley. We are uh, doing a presentation together that we wanted to do uh, at the Open Infrastructure Summit, and uh, only, only I got to run it live. So I, I didn't want to just record it. I wanted to bring Mark in and uh, let us have the conversation that we planned. Does that sound like a good idea for you, Mark? It does. It sounds like a great idea. I miss the idea of us being able to present together. I think this is a, an important and, um, at least from my perspective, an interesting topic. So I'm looking forward to chatting our way through it. And one of the things I like about this presentation is that you and I don't agree on everything. <laughs> and so True. True. It, yeah. it, adds, it adds some spice that, that was not captured well. I tried to rep for you, but yep. I didn't yep. have that spice. Um, so the, the, the theme for here is don't touch that, uh, why edge IT is not cloud IT. And uh, let me pull up, pull up our first slide. Oh, I like this picture. Um, the, uh, so the, the point for here is that when in the conversation we're gonna have, edge is really about integration automation, which is which are cloud themes, but it's also different because unlike cloud infrastructure, it's physically distributed, logically restricted, and networking limited, uh, which is a whole bunch of big words. Um, right, I mean, Mark, people think that you don't, you know, they know that you don't go to a, a cloud data center and, t you know, touch the servers. You're just, everything's API driven. Do you have a, a, a synopsis on why, you know, the don't touch that's even more important from an edge perspective? Well, it's interesting. Um... Rob, I think that not touching it um, from an edge perspective uh, comes from what would be considered a lot of obvious areas of opportunity. One is that um, financially it would be irresponsible to assume that you could build 10, 20, or 100 locations mm -hmm. and support a small set of applications across those 100 locations with um, the uh, need to acquire a human and a truck and tools and insurance and all that stuff um, to go between locations, keeping it running. I mean, and, and we could talk in detail about what keeping it running it might mean depending on what you were implementing, but just from a simple standpoint, if that's your plan, then, then logically it's failed most workload return on investment opportunities as we know them today before you even get started, right? It's, it's, that um, idea, it's idea that a data center has a staff. That's even right. If, even if, you know, and, uh, remote cell location or a edge data center, even a, you know, something in a convenience store. Right, doesn't, but I think, doesn't. I think maybe more controversial to that, um, but I think just as important is if we think about what, um, at least when I think about it, and I, I think this is something you and I, in fact, I'm sure this is something you and I both agree on, but if, if I'm putting infrastructure in places where I can't really afford to have bodies touch it, then I'm gonna be making a lot of other assumptions about it. I'm going to be making assumptions that I'm also not going to put it in a Fort Knox. Right. I'm not going to have roving robots running around it. It's going to be the equivalent of a box of gear that has power and is connected and has the minimum um, associated environmentals to keep it running in the location it's in with a predetermined value on um, risk of hardware failure, et cetera, et cetera, so that if I install 10 locations, it's because I need nine, and that's because over a three-year period, I can expect about a 10% failure rate. Or I could lose any one location at any one point in time and not have to worry about it. And the reason that's important is if I'm thinking from that perspective anyway, because of the financial issues associated of not thinking that way, then why would I be trying to build something that requires hands-on when I need to do an upgrade locally, or when I need to replace a piece of hardware, or when I need to patch for uh, something like the latest attack on Intel chips, it makes no sense whatsoever. The uh, all right, so you're you're prewinding some of our conversation, and and I I want I want us to take a second and introduce ourselves because uh, you and I do a lot of talking to different we groups, do. but it yeah. you know. Go, you, you got, I gave you the cheese touch slide, so go ahead right. and get to your background. <laughs> yeah, so um, Mark Teeley, Director of Engineering and Edge Computing um, at Ericsson. 
Uh, I'm also the chair for the IDCA technical community uh, committee. The IDCA is the International Data Center Authority, um, but uh, uh, belaying or belying the name is the fact that um, uh, IDCA is actually working on, and that's what the technical committee is worried about, is um, building um, something we're calling the infinity paradigm. And uh, the infinity paradigm is really, for lack of a better description, the application ecosystem. And the application ecosystem um, involves everything that would make IT function, from site selection to corporate sustainability, from um, power plumbing to, um, to APIs, and everything in between. Right. And so um, a, a lot of my work through my career uh, on building infrastructure, building data centers, building large uh, and global um, teams, et cetera, have sort of led me to this spot. But the reality is, is that I'm doing this uh, chair role as a volunteer role because, well, frankly, the industry has given me quite a bit. Um, uh, I've been fairly lucky. I've met a lot of terrific people. Um, including the other half of this podcast uh, or presentation um, and uh, been to a lot of terrific places, made a decent living for myself and my family. Uh, and so I enjoy giving back and helping others um, pursue dreams in this industry as well. And so a big part of what IDCA does beyond this committee is they train uh, people for some of the jobs that are hardest to fill right now in the industry. And so that's a, um, a big part of why I help out. And, and beyond that, uh, I do advising to several startups uh, on the board of one company and um, am a, a lover of basketball. <laughs> Good to be in, in Las Vegas then for that. That's right, that's right. The, uh, and one of the things I think is important, you know, is that Mark talks to people everywhere. Um, and, and a lot of what, what, and I'll switch to my slide, um, See, I got Samuel L. Jackson. Nice. Like, since I got to make the slides. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's all who gets to pick the pictures. That's right. The, uh, and, and so one of the things, so my name's Rob Hirschfeld. I'm CEO and co-founder of RackN, uh, which uh, supports um, physical layer automation for data centers. So we're really focused on helping people, just like Mark, improve their data center experience, right? We, we have very shared values in that, we think the industry could be so much more productive, but productive in a human way, um, so that people have you know aren't fighting fires. They're not inventing things all the time. They're they're able to reuse and share and and train for data center operations and, and that experience. And so a lot of what RackN is about is helping helping build software in that sort of neglected space. Um, and I also co-host a, po a podcast called The Latest Shiny. Um, and we are really the only edge focused podcast that we're aware of. We do open source and DevOps and a whole bunch of other things, but we, we talk about edge quite a bit. Uh, Mark's been on the show. Uh, we've been on each other's shows a bit. So I'd encourage that as a exercise for the listener. Um, but I, you know, it's the nice thing about doing podcasts is that we get to talk to people um, and we get to listen. Uh, and I, I think it's, it's easy to underestimate the value of uh, the listening and, and thinking through and, and, and hearing how people are going. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, so this frames up the, the problem space a little bit, and then the talk is really a, us with a couple of, of key points to discuss. I think we have just four. Um, and the, the, point, the point with this that sort of set Mark and I on this journey is that when you're talking about edge, you're talking about managing thousands of sites. Um, I don't think we're going to get too distracted by latency or number of servers or things like that. Um, but we, we do, we do need people to think through most data center tools, most data center deployments are in the tens of units or ones of units. Um, so it's just the way we've built the tooling. We've assumed that we have high, easy access to the systems when we need them and that we're, we're just not building to repeat. And the slides help give you a sense of how different the edge management problem will be, right? This is a hundred machines. Uh, this is a thousand. There, there is no human way to manage a thousand data centers. No. Um, right. I, I know there are a lot of people who struggle with five or six with the current tool sets. This isn't just a, hey, simple problem. This is two orders of magnitude beyond the way we've thought about 
data center operations in the past. Right. Well, if I could cut in really quickly yeah. too, Rob, I mean, um, if you think about that, the one of the common problems, and I'm sure you've run into this as part of your business when you're approaching IT staff, because it would have happened in any of the IT staff that I had in early jobs that I was in um, from say, you know, the nineties through the mid two thousands, um, uh, you know, 2005, 2006 timeframe, but that, you know, even the companies that have three or four data centers, um, generally speaking, don't have a team that is dedicated to professional data center management or professional hardware mm -hmm. management, right? And so even if you, you make the assumption that tools could work um, across uh, multiple sites that we use today, many of these companies don't even have the same tools in three data centers and they don't do, they don't believe because they don't use the same tools and because they don't measure effectively their impact on opportunity. Um, uh, many, many of us uh, continue to build thinking, well, it's a one-off. I'll just build this. It'll be done with. And then next week it's a one-off and I'll build this and it'll be done with. Um, and at the end of the year, when you've done a thousand one-offs, you realize, crap, if I just spent that extra three days and done this right from the beginning, uh, I could have done that thousand one-offs in, in a third or a quarter or a tenth of the time. And that kind of thinking, uh, you know, another way I've prefaced that kind of thinking in the past is the old way of, you know, just throw more bodies and hardware at the problem. That kind of thinking will not solve for the edge. And whether it's what you look for in your provider or what you look for to build for yourself, or even how you consider the fact that you might have multiple deployment models for different application types out to the edge. And how do you support the underlying infrastructure for that? Um, you know, these are real problems that um, are not sexy to think about up front, but if you don't think about them, um, you're, you're going to fail from, uh, you know, an operational success standpoint and from a return on investment standpoint. It's, this is one of those things where, you know, IT got a reputation for saying no because they knew that this was a problem and Amazon capitalized on saying yes. <laughs> right. and I think we're back to a sprawl. We're back to an IT sprawl in the cloud. Uh, we are, yes, but, we are absolutely. And, and that's not going to work in edge. And actually this is, this is a good segue for the next slide. Uh, edge is not cloud, um, right? We can't just scale down platforms, um, you know, and, and say, oh, this is a mini Amazon uh, everywhere or a mini OpenStack uh, or a mini VMware. Uh, and we can't just scale up our management. So we can't just come in and say, oh, I'm using, uh, you know, Chef to, or Ansible to manage this. You know, I'm just going to, or Terraform, I'm going to Terraform up oh, <laughs> a thousand sites. Um, that's, that's, those aren't, the tools aren't, they, they have to be designed for that. Um, and so that, that's where this slide tees up sort of this idea that we have to scale in the platforms and scale out the management. Um, Mark, I invented that, the scale in thing. Do you, do you want to put a gloss on it or do you want me to try and explain it? No, no, no. I mean, I like it. And I, um, I would, I would actually love to hear um, the way you would define it. But from my perspective, um, you know, this goes back to what we were talking about in the early slides. And I think it's important, incredibly important to cover that um, it, this is, if, if I'm following you at all, that this is as much a way of thinking about what you own as it is the tools that you use to manage what you own. Right. I, I'll, I'll give a very concrete example of, of something that I, I was watching. Um, we were supposed to talk about this at the OpenStack Summit or Open Infrastructure Summit. So I'm, I'm not going to be shy about, and I wasn't shy then, I'm, I won't be shy now about sort of talking about things in that community. Um, there's an example, they, they, there's a project that they're promoting called Airship that um, uses um, open, uh, it uses, <laughs> It's, it's a Kubernetes under OpenStack installer. And so it wraps um, a bare metal installer called Maz to build Helm charts in a static way to install OpenStack and Kubernetes. And it's, it's this incredibly complex set of, of actions that are all tied together because we're trying to use platforms that already exist in, in the ways that they weren't designed for. So this, the scale in concept to me says, 
don't add complexity to accomplish a task. Right. Right. So, so the idea that I'm going to take Kubernetes and I'm going to, you know, cram all this stuff around Kubernetes to make it do something that it's not designed to do instead of fixing OpenStack to be easier to run inside of Kubernetes, that's, that would be scaling in, right? I would love to see somebody take OpenStack and say, all right, we're going to cut all the nonsense off. We're going to make it work really well in Kubernetes as a Kubernetes workload. Um, that's our goal. That would be scaling in the platform for the function. Right. Um, instead of this, you know, Frankenstein monster of spare parts that, that, you know, isn't, isn't actually designed for this task. We're, we're not going to accomplish thousand data center scale out with, with, you know, kludge together tools that were designed for different function. That's what, right. that's sort of where my thinking is on this. Yeah, no, and I would agree with all that. And I would also agree that, or, or would mention that um, for most of us, the value opportunity of, um, or I shouldn't say the value opportunity, the opportunity of creating value at the edge is likely going to be associated with um, lowest barrier to entry and a very specific opportunity from a, a workload type, as opposed to, I want to move everything I can do in a data center today that has 500 machines and 10 people supporting it. And I want to put that in 50 locations that all only have four machines each. Okay. Um, that's not going to work. And your, your, your desire to hedge your bets um, for what is potentially a, um, a very different future by putting a little bit of everything in there, I think means that you're not going to be able to be good at anything. And, um, and frankly, uh, uh, likely uh, going to be spending 40 to 80% of your hardware install costs and overhead and uh, risks of failure and risks to uh, agility relative to upgrade and, and patching and replacement, et cetera, um, to support workloads that are likely, uh, in many cases at least, to support the type of workload that's unlikely to be long-term needed at the edge anyway. The vast majority of workloads at the edge are likely going to be very, very, very small footprint. They're not going to be VM oriented. In many cases, they won't even be container oriented. Um, mm. And they could be web oriented. They could be function as a service oriented. They might scale on containers, maybe. Um, but this idea that um, we need to hedge our bets and put this kind of heavyweight solution in every location. Um, and again, I could be wrong, but uh, I think um, I think we're we're setting the bar too high for success at the beginning by trying to do that. So you teed up our next slide pretty well. Um, and I don't want to read this, these questions out loud, right? But the point, of the, the point of this slide is that we have a lot of questions. Mark and I are going to talk through all of them more or less as we go. I think Mark just covered this list pretty darn well. Um, but it's the type of things that we talk about on our podcasts all right. the time. Um, one of the ones that's interesting to me is, you know, are there killer apps? It's funny that you picked that one. I was just going to pick that one too. Go ahead and finish and I want to add on to it. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, we're talking uh, on Latest Shiny, we're talking about to gaming, a lot of game developers, and apparently gaming is a very edge, edgy uh, application because of the latency requirements and the, and the globally distributed aspect and the interaction. So it has yep. a good pattern for that. Um, my, my thought on killer apps is actually the idea that there are some things that are very expensive to mass, mass produce, um, those being batteries and compute and CPUs. Yep. Um, and so the killer app to me is actually more about taking, uh, being able to build a device that doesn't, that doesn't cost a lot in battery or power consumption or CPU overhead and offload that to a, a edge infrastructure. Um, and that's going to be true with cars. It's going to be true with VR headsets or augmented reality. It's, I think it's true for phones. Yep. Um, and so, the, you know, the, to me, the killer apps are places where the human interaction requires, you know, high touch and high interaction, but the cost of that experience really needs to be an infrastructure cost, not a device cost. What's, right. what's yours? Well, no, so I would, first of all, I would agree. I think I'm agreeing with everything you said. And okay. before I jump into what I was going to say, um, it's funny, you know, I've been, uh, uh, 
I binged watched uh, while waiting at a, a couple of airports recently, this show called The Expanse, right? And it's on, it's on Prime. It's a sci-fi sci show. Hmm. And the, what I noticed about the show, and whether they were atten intentionally doing this or not, is hard to say. But what I noticed about the show is that almost everyone, regardless of position, had um, a, a, a phone-like device that looked basically like a, an iPhone-shaped piece of plexiglass that could show some 3D imaging and stuff like that. And so why do I bring that up? It's, it's sci-fi, right? It doesn't mean anything. Well, I think it actually points to something that a lot of people would probably disagree with me on. Um, in fact, I've talked to some people just recently who disagree with me on this point, is that um, the phone, when it first came out, the iPhone, when it first came out, was actually a lowering of a barrier to entry in order to introduce tens of thousands and now millions of new applications to a customer base at a very low cost per application. It was a lowering of the barrier to entry, but the barrier to entry was insurmountable before. So the new barrier to entry being the iPhone seemed like a non-issue because you needed a phone anyway and you weren't paying that much phone more for your iPhone than you were for a Blackberry or a Symbian device or something like that. Uh, so that barrier to entry seemed like a non-starter. Well, come 10 years later, 12 years later, the iPhone now and other phones that are that expensive are in fact a barrier to entry. And to me, the one of the really interesting opportunities at the edge is in fact to give people the equivalent of throwaway devices that give them 99% of what they need to do on a daily basis. And if they drop it in a sewer, if they break it in their car, if they sit on it, who gives a crap? They can pick one up for a nickel equivalent somewhere and have everything they need available to them and transported to them across counties, which is another part we can talk about, you know, relative to edge, across cities, across nation states, et cetera, the same way you assume your phone will work today. Now, so anyway, long story um, uh, that I wasn't even going to talk about before Rob mentioned that, but another way to think about killer apps is that for me, there's three different ways to consider it. Killer app means to some people that it's an application that will generate enough money on its own to, but per customer to justify spending an exorbitant amount of money to distribute infrastructure and application stuff everywhere, right? That's how some people look at what a killer app is, right? So in other words, we don't have the killer app yet to justify building out a lot of edge infrastructure. Well, uh, I would take that to, to the next point, which is that to me, uh, it's more likely that killer apps are going to be 10,000 apps that make pennies per potential customer rather than 10 apps that make dollars per potential customer. Um, and that uh, killer apps probably, um, in fact, most of them are literally waiting there to be deployed till the right barriers to entry are lowered to the wow. point about a really cheap device, to the point about being able to distribute workloads cost effectively, and when, so when I think about that, and Rob, I'd love to get your thoughts back on this. When I think about that, that's why I think we are focusing on the edge opportunity the wrong way if we think that extending what we do today, but somehow distributing it in 10,000 locations is a successful model for the edge when at a minimum, that infrastructure would cost as much and most likely cost more than what we provide at core today, which means that we haven't lowered the barrier to entry for all of those 10,000 little apps. And I think that's you know both the biggest opportunity and the biggest risk to the future of the edge. All right, so we are definitely gonna dive in on that, that a little bit more. Um, especially because we're going to talk app versus platform, but let me get, let me get two slides in because we're about to tee up another point that you were making um, that I want to go to. The, the, the point of that list in, in some ways is, and, and I think what, what you should be hearing from Mark and I is that there isn't a right answer there, yep. right there, but there's, so, so if, if somebody's going to tell you, I have the thing that's going to do blah, it's, it's, that's just not true. Um, 
the, at the same time, finding solutions to the problems that we do have is really, really urgent. And the reason it's urgent is because the last item on that list, um, which is that there's some behemoths marching around in the space that aren't waiting around for a design committee to decide what the right platform is. Absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how much I would add to this without just um, you know making that vein on the side of my head pulse. <laughs> But uh, I mean, and, and, you know, I know that we both um, uh, uh, have plenty of admiration for what AWS and Azure and Google They're amazing. Do not, They're do amazing not take organizations. These for granted. That's right. That's right. Um, but it's also true that, um, you know, like any large organization, um, the bigger they get, the bigger the appetite and the edge opportunity um, when taken, uh, you know, uh, superficially by what people have said, like Michael Dell saying it'll be a hundred times um, public cloud, what public cloud is today, a um, hundred times is a big number. Um, there are, you know, probably 30 million servers in the public cloud today, maybe more based on my calculations. And um, to think it would be, a, a, can you imagine 30 million to 300 million equivalent server locations around the world for edge? at some point in the next 10 or 15 years. Um, that's a market that these guys can't afford to uh, miss. And I believe um, that, and you know, again, uh, Rob, you should add some comment here maybe, but um, I believe that our opportunity as buyers in this space is to create um, enough abstraction that allows for the deployment of um, usable uh, and effective workloads under any one of a number of deployment models, deployment models of application design type and, um, and, and um, code base, et cetera, not necessarily infrastructure type, um, with the ability to use uh, almost any network um, to supply benefit to a customer from a latency location geography standpoint. And I don't think that if we let the largest cloud players uh, carve up the edge environment that we will get to that nirvana sooner. I think we will either not get to that nirvana or it will take us a lot longer and will limit the opportunity for innovation at the edge. I think that's right. And you're teeing up the next slide, but I'll, I'll make my, my Amazon point um, in this. There's a reason why San Francisco just decided they wanted to make facial recognition technologies illegal. And if people think that the amount of uh, AI analytics is going to continue at a moderate pace, you're just wrong, right? Yep. The reason why San Francisco made that you know, law as, as mixed as I am on, on their actions there, it's because they know <laughs> that there is a huge wave of AI coming that says, I'm gonna know everything you're doing. Um, and it's not just going to be your face, it's going to be your gait and your voice and your, yep. you know, all the data you leak and all those things. And, and these companies aren't just, don't just have an appetite to be service providers. The, they, you know, they're data brokers. Um, yep. Yeah, and, and people just, we, 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 well, and, we and, don't and appreciate that. Frankly, frankly, you know, they, they see this as, as if they have no other choice, right? Because if they don't do it, somebody else will collect that data yeah. and um, lock them out of the market because that data about us as humans is what makes the world go around. So one of the points that, that you bring up, that you brought up here and I think is worth reinforcing is that 50% of the edge infrastructure is already in place. Um, this is one of your big points. I think it's, it's something that people have a hard time understanding. Um, Without having more of a phone, a telephone system background, do you want to? You want to, uh, you know, add add some pieces in that? Um, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I'll, I'll I'll go back into my my rant about the heterogeneity of it. Uh, okay. You sort of cool. tee it up. Yeah, I mean, if you um, if you if you were to to overlay, um, uh, you know, or put a map of the world on the table and flatten it out, and then then um, overlay that map with uh, the different operators, what you would find is that. The different operators, whether it's Verizon or BT or Telstra or 
Malaysia Telecom or any one of uh, you know 800 others that are, exist in the world today, you would find that you create fiefdoms. You don't create a global network, you create a fiefdom. And for the most part, these operators don't like sharing with each other. It was, it was, it was practically an act of God to get them to share and allow for um, uh, you know, being on multiple networks on your phone and, and crossing bound, country boundary lines and still using the same phone, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that problem is likely to continue to be an issue for workloads at the edge. Uh, more complex workloads that require consistent latency and aren't made to be in devices that can be turned off all the time and um, can suffer outages for lengths of, of, of time and then still operate. And so when I think about that, I think about the problem of the fact that they're not overlapping, but the opportunity, which is that if we can make tools that allow us to share across these networks, then effectively, the vast majority of what makes the edge even an opportunity at all is that we have network everywhere already that touches virtually every customer on the planet. Almost every customer on the planet, right? There is. This to me is the, is one of the fallacies that, that you're helping me unwind. It's, you know, this idea that we're going to put little data centers on every cell phone tower doesn't make sense you know, the phone companies already have the data centers everywhere. <laughs> yeah. they're, they're, and so we're going to use the infrastructure that's in place. We need this built out really quickly. Now they're not cloud data centers, but they are, there's, there's infrastructure here. And so when I think about the edge and, and how the edge is, is likely to grow, instead of saying, you know, Amazon and maybe Amazon and Google and Microsoft have the money to do this and just build data centers all over the place. In contain, you know, little drop containers everywhere, but it's not yeah. really their pattern. What what's more likely to happen is they're going to say, "Oh, I need to put my Amazon outpost post rack inside of AT and T's pop in every tier two market," yeah. and and that's you know, and AT and T's going to say that doesn't fit in our pops. You have to use our infrastructure, um, or you know, and then in that point, Amazon says, hell no, I'm just going to drop, I'm going to drone in my containers and put, you know, 5G antennas on top of them. And you're, you know, and they, they're, they're, these are the scenarios. And the, the, there's so much money that, that that bypassing the current infrastructure is a real threat yep. um, from, from they're going to go. And so right now, everything's a bad choice. Um, if you want to do edge today, you're looking at, you know, doing it yourself, standing up multiple colos. Um, I just did a podcast with somebody who's doing an edge platform and they've got 25 did, you know, cloud infrastructure sites co cobbled together from Microsoft and Google and Amazon and uh, Packet and some other stuff. So it's like, uh, they, but that's what they did to build a edge platform. Yep. Um, or you just have to say, I'm all in on Amazon and wherever Amazon has a site, which is pretty good coverage in general. Um, it's not edge, but it's distributed cloud. Uh, that might be sufficient for what you got to do, but either one is going to be a risk for you. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and I mean, when you, when you think about, uh, I, I realized that you caveated your statement already and said that, you know, it may be good enough for some workloads, but if you are thinking that a cloud operator will get you, um, something approaching real edge outside of the specific edge circle around a, um, an AWS zone or a Google campus somewhere, um, then I would argue that you're wrong. It, it, the, the studies that I've looked at and tested to some degree myself indicate that average latency um, between cloud provider and customer in the North America, which is the most buried cloud market in the world at the moment, is at, uh, somewhere around 110 milliseconds. So the low was 70 milliseconds and the high was 160 milliseconds. And I'm a, this may be, you know, a discussion for a different day, but I'm of the mind that um, if we can use the infrastructure that already exists, if we can find the deployment models that allow us to lower the barrier to entry for use and for deployment of applications, similar to the change that occurred when the uh, iPhone first came to market, um, then we create an enormous upswell of opportunity at low cost of entry. That low cost of entry means that now people will need to compete more and more at 
service like latency. And, um, you know, contrary to what a lot of people believe, going from 20 to 30 milliseconds or 20 to 40 milliseconds is actually a big deal. And as data loads increase, that, that deal can be even worse. And you just made the, the, the point of the next slide. Right? I'm pretty or good at that. We're, it's, you're, it's, it's almost like we have a design presentation. No kidding. Uh, uh, you know, uh, this would be fun if we, if we did it 10 times and got it down to a, our own hearty stick. But, uh, yep, yep. But hopefully people are enjoying it. I hope um, so. You know, but this is the thing. We already have enough clouds. And Edge is not just Amazon expanding its data center footprint. Uh, there's something new that Mark was talking about. And, you know, this is where, you know, I, I thought through a little bit what that statement is, because I, I can see somebody saying, I'm just going to go, you know, put my application in every Amazon data center. And, um, and you might be able to get away with that, you know, shy of what Mark's describing with real measured latencies. But it's worth thinking about what, what the difference ends up looking like. Um, because, you know, it is just like cloud, it's API driven, it's self-service, it's highly automated, it's platform focused. Um, and by platform, I mean, you know, you might be, you might want Kubernetes or a storage infrastructure or Lambda and a serverless component. All of those pieces, right, when you consume edge, you're going to look for those things from your, uh, uh, your, an edge provider, just like a cloud provider, and you're going to see them in cloud. So part of my expectation is, and we'll actually, we'll, I have some slides to talk about what those expectations are, but it's not like cloud either because it's, it, it's, you have to design it to be distributed, right? Amazon doesn't really have tools that, that make sure that your data is moved around all those data centers. They think of them as, as discrete data centers. Um, and it's really not multi-vendor, right? You, you, you might not have the, or want to have you know, a vendor lock-in in this case, or they, they might not provide the geos you need or the latencies you need. Um, and, and Mark, you're bringing up a topic I hadn't even really put in these slides and location sensitive is sort of it, but there are some latency sensitivities. There's some performance sensitivities that, um, the public cloud is not built for. Uh, no, it, yeah, they really aren't. Uh, I don't know how much detail we should go into that, but, um, the, you know, the, one of the biggest problems the cloud providers would recognize is the fact that many, um, companies don't want to put their large data sets inside the public cloud. And if they don't want to put their large data sets in the public cloud, those same enterprises also then realize that they can't put all their applications in the public cloud either, because if they put their application in the public cloud and leave the data in their data center, they don't get the performance they need to satisfy the customer. <laughs> and that brings up the next slide. Yep. Uh, right. We're, we're seeing a huge trend towards Kubernetes as the sort of the de facto plat application platform piece. Um, Kubernetes going to metal as a solution for these edge data centers where you don't want the virtualization overhead. Um, ideally, the, you, know, you build an application for Kubernetes, you don't care that it's running on VMs or metal. It's, a, it's an infrastructure yep. uh, piece. Um, and this might seem like a random insertion. We, we sort of haven't talked very concretely about platforms. Um, and what I, what I, I don't really want to turn this into an advertisement for Kubernetes. <laughs> um, it doesn't need our help. Uh, but what I, what I do, what I do think is worth talking about is, you know, developers need platforms. Uh, and when we talk about edge, I think some people just automatically assume there's a platform. Is, do, you, do you, do you think that people just assume that edge is an infrastructure or edge is a platform? I think it runs the gamut. Uh, I don't, uh, I don't think that there's a consistent view right now, just like the the perception of what edge is uh, depends on what angle you're coming from as a potential user or buyer mm -hmm. uh, or developer. Um, but I would, I would argue that um, uh, it's, it's pretty commonly assumed that it's going to be some sort of um, uh, pass type environment that you're going to be able to deploy to and manage from. Makes sense. And, and I think that, you know, there are aspects to edge development, in, in our in our conversations of that are going to have to be handled by machine, and maybe this is where to me the word platform is really di is is different than infrastructure. So when you talk about infrastructure, you're like, I need to buy a server, I need to buy, you know, it's it's the the sort of the stuff of the the, the data center. Yeah. When we talk about thousands of data centers, you don't manage data center data centers in the thousands with infrastructure. 
you manage them as a platform. Even the data center infrastructure itself is going to have to be managed as a platform. Absolutely right. A federated view of, of the infrastructure and it, it yep. disappears. Everything, yeah. Everything from syncing time to, to balancing workload capacity. I mean, you name it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, and so the thing, when I think about platforms and one of the things that, that, uh, when I gave this talk at, at the open infrastructure talk, I, I was I criticized OpenStack for missing was that the people who are going to do this work are going to be comfortable with cl the cloud. So it's not that edge is cloud, but cloud is going to drive the patterns of consumption that people are used to. And so part of thinking through what these platforms need to look like is they can't have a lot of cognitive dissonance or I would say impedance mismatch maybe with what the cloud, the, the, the developers, the, the, the people using the platforms already expect to do. The operational interactions need to be very similar, which is why Kubernetes to me is, is the thing. It might not be that Kubernetes is, is a great edge platform, but Kubernetes patterns of use will be what edge platforms are gonna look like. Does that make sense? I think I think it does. I mean, I think it does, and there there are already a wide range of um, of technology options for how you can deploy uh, workloads uh, across networks, and uh, you know, based on latency, and and manage them remotely, and even manage based on um, capacity failure and and um, and load balancing and things like that across multiple locations. And to some degree, Kubernetes can can do that um, at some limited scale, but. Um, you know, it's hard to say what what all will occur in Kubernetes that that makes it more of a tool for the edge versus um, more of a competitor for OpenStack, which would, in my mind, would would make it less of a tool for the edge long term. <laughs> um, but um, you know, right now, um, if you're going to be deploying containers um, as opposed to doing it, you know, via you know some sort of a web application or um, uh, something else, then uh, Kubernetes is, is likely your best bet. And so, you know, your, your goal as a buyer of that service, if that's what you're doing versus a developer of that service, is the ability to see your thousand locations as if they're one and as if, as if they were individuals um, from the form of uh, monitoring, management, and deployment. Uh, and all the things that go into that, whether it's uh, governance and policy around where data can be located, how it follows the customer, how capacity is managed across locations, how individual failure of locations is managed, uh, how uh, platform updates occur, uh, you name it, uh, and how those updates occur all the way down to bare metal, right? Um, that, that the difference, as Rob is pointing out, and maybe it's not the exact point he was trying to make, but the difference here is that, you know, you you are looking at one data center. It's just that data center is in a thousand locations potentially, and that's a very very different support model. It, it's something Mark and I have been talking around, and uh, as a teaser, we've been we've been describing that as a continuously integrated data center. Yep. Um, and and in this case, it's a continuously integrated fleet of data centers. Um, Right. Sort of really exciting. But I guess my, my point here is that not that it that we may or may not choose Kubernetes, but Kubernetes uh, footprint and the operational patterns of describing the application as a YAML file, those patterns are going to be the winning patterns for edge platforms. Um, I, I don't have to bet on Kubernetes, but I, I can bet on the, the idea that, that the way people are used to interacting with that is going to define what a good edge platform looks like. And yeah, yeah. Op OpenStack to me resisted Amazon as the de facto way clouds were used more than they should have. And it, it slowed them down, um, right. slowed us down. I was, I was there at the time, but we didn't understand why. We, we, we thought it was competitive. It's about operational things. And so I, Mark, we're, you know, I, if Steven was listening, he'd be, you know, waving flags and things Would like be. that about time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, and this is this is sort of our, our wrap up, right? When you and I sat down to have this talk, this was actually our first point. And, and we, we had to build, we wanted to build up to it. it it's, it's, when people think about edge, 
what, what they're, they're not talking about the things that you and I are banging on the table thinking they should. You want to you wanna take a shot at some of these, these, these top underrepresented yeah. challenges? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I probably don't need to talk about we're not building something new. Uh, I think, you know, we've, we've covered that pretty well, but yeah. cross-operator integration, I talked about that a little bit, sometimes called hybrid. Um, and whether this is uh, service providers that cross networks that help you or networks themselves that have found ways to, to share work workloads and expose appropriate services across um, operator-owned territory, um, these are real challenges that we can continue to dance around. We can continue to talk about how um, you know, I could deploy this app in you know, one-third of the United States, uh, and that may work for for some some companies and we're on one type of hardware or on one right. network transit yeah this right. is this is not or, going to be a homogeneous solution yeah or you know because i know amazon i can only deploy to those places that have decided to take amazon outpost into their um uh their uh, their phone closets or their central offices uh and then when you want to deploy to the other 30 or 40 percent of a country um you're going to have to do it another way and then then that goes back to the barrier to entry thing, right? I mean, how many companies, even big companies, don't define or develop an application deployment around supporting that same application in two different cloud environments, two different, not two different locations of similar cloud environments, but two different cloud environments, like one, uh, one instance of the application running on Google and another instance of the application running on Amazon, and those two, zones, for lack of a better term, acting as if they are one big data center in two locations. That does not happen today. And it doesn't happen because the services are all different. And you can't just combine and put an app into the services of AWS and then somehow transplant those services over to Google. It requires new coding, new APIs. And so that's costly and complex. And so people aren't doing it. We have to avoid creating that same environment at the edge if the edge is gonna represent the vast majority of those tiny workload opportunities that again, will only be successful if we're successful at helping to lower that barrier to entry. Um, and, and this, you know, what, um, what, what you're describing to me yeah. is, is a dilemma. Yep. Um, is designing for heterogeneous systems is expensive and hard. I know because yep. it's one of the hallmarks of what Racken does, right? We spend a lot of time trying to fix that problem it's much easier to do a homogeneous thing. Yep. Um, the, thing that, the thing that Mark and I are both pounding on the table saying is edge is not going to be homogeneous. So don't, don't start from there. All right, we need to keep going. Uh, no, right. zero, zero touch bare metal. Um, this is really to me the central point that gave rise to the whole presentation. Fix the problem from the bare metal layer up. You, you don't yep. have the luxury of thinking that you're going to slap a virtualization layer on and then automate the, the cloud layer at a thousand data center system. Fix it, yep. right? You never know when we, we had a new zombie, you know, there's a new chip defect called zombie load that's going to require BIOS patches and kernel migrations ASAP. Yep. I, hey, I... Don't expect that that's the last one, the last thing you're going to have to do a global rollout of all your systems for. It's, yep. it's the status quo, especially if you're in heterogeneous systems where it's ARM and Intel and AMD and uh, RISC-V, yep. whatever. Yep, uh, absolutely. absolutely. Locality, locality and transit, uh, this is a whole topic, talk on its own. Um, yep. And then uh, and, and the same thing with security, right? I mean, um, you're talking about um, potentially hundreds or thousands of new endpoints uh, of your comp of the representation of your company to a set of customers, whether those customers are your employees or um, external customers that are buying your company's products. And um, I think at a minimum, uh, if I just take one bullet point associated with security is that you need to think about how you can apply security so that you can remove, cut off, the damaged flesh as mm. quickly as possible, right? So the damaged flesh could be where you have a threat already existing that you can't fix. So you just shut off the location and shutting off that location has no impact on the rest of your capability 
because it's a server in a group of servers rather than part of the functionality of your edge environment. And then on the other side of the coin, it's your ability to, to keep threats at bay as much as possible. Going back to bullet number two, zero touch from bare metal, is your ability to upgrade remotely at scale, uh, do it quickly and do it as often as you need to without interrupting the, the work of the customer. It's crazy tall job. And it is. Then, and I think both of us, these are the conversations we want to have about edge. I, 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 I will speak for you, Mark. I, I know you, you don't want to have more, you know, autonomous cars and, and drones and, you know, those are fun conversations to have, but they're not solving the use case conversations aren't solving these problems. Right. Um, right. And so, there's, there's a lot of that already. I, I, I really want to have conversations where people are like, all right, let's fix the foundations we're going to build these platforms on because solving it from the top down is really thinking about it like cloud, right? Because at the yeah. end of the day, our, our, you know, this edge infrastructure has a totally different mindset, right? And that's, yeah. that's, the, that's this don't touch. Hey, it's got to work without human humans being involved. Yeah, at, at one point, each location of that edge environment that you're deploying to needs to be as if it's a, a critical function of your body. And yet, at the same point, you need to be able to cut it off and keep going as if nothing happened. And if you can't define your edge environment um, from that aspect, then I think you're failed from an operational ownership standpoint already, uh, not to mention deployment costs. Um, and is that, is that um, the, that's the starfish starfish methodology of data center design? Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah. So you know what you know what I I like the idea of talking more about how do we lower the barriers to entry? How do we find entry points that allow more people to do more things at the edge uh, more successfully to drive up opportunity for everyone involved for the consumer to get more enjoyment of, for using apps at the edge that benefit their lives in one way or the other. And from the builders of the infrastructure and the applications and the services that will facilitate those applications, I think we stand to raise more boats higher in the bay um, by finding the right ways to lower the barrier to entry um, than we do by um, uh, narrowly focusing on solving for um, a perceived problem at the edge. That's, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan right now that we're in the scramble. A lot yeah. of different things are going to come forward. The faster they come forward, the better. But they've yeah, got to be absolutely. fully embrace, embrace that they're going to uh, come and go, and we've got to be able to adapt. If you think Kubernetes <laughs> or any, any platform is going to be the thing five years from now, Right. You haven't, you haven't been paying attention. And well, and, and just, you know, I, I mentioned the iPhone earlier and you know, we can talk about the, just in wrap up uh, kind of, um, you think about the internet in 1992, 1993, some of us were noodling around on what would become the internet, finding IP addresses and looking at geeky stuff that people had posted and the occasional equivalent of VI posted online for us to read about <laughs> how somebody had coded something or whatever. And that was about the extent of opportunity. 99% of the population had no idea. In fact, we're even stating that this will never become anything. Yeah. By 1995, mm -hmm. it was a multi, multi-billion dollar opportunity around the world. And 10 years after that, we don't even know how to live without the internet. And if we don't accept that the edge is that marketplace waiting to happen right now with the right uh, encumbrances removed, um, then I think we're really just uh, ignoring history. I think that's a nice summary. The edge is the 1995 internet. That's right. It's the dial up version of the internet. And we're not even, we're not even, we're just looking at DSL. Yep. So. Yep. Awesome. Mark, thank you. Uh, no, thank you, man. This was fun. This was great. I, and we would love to continue the dialogue. Uh, Mark and I both you know, host a podcast. And so we, we, we love to have these conversations on, on our podcasts. 
we are very active on the Twitters. Um, Absolutely. Uh, and you know, we're not shy about people having different opinions. So that's right. feel free to, to highlight things you liked, feel things free to highlight things you disagree with and let's, let's talk about it. Have a, have Absolutely. a beer, f- frosty beverage and, and figure out how to make things go. Sounds good. Awesome.